I'm Carl Bishop, the itinerant voice actor for Wise Brother Media, and I've got with me today filmmaker Ken Burns. How are you? Good morning. I'm very well, thank you. Well, it's great to talk to you. And, you know, as a voice actor, I want to start right off the bat and ask, what goes into choosing just the right narrator for your movie? Or is it just a few people you like to fall back on? Well, it's a combination of things. One is that we have, over the last four decades, developed, I guess, what you call a stable of extraordinary yeah, talent. Indeed. And when, you, <laughs> when you have a, a, a Meryl Streep or a Tom Hanks or, or Morgan Freeman. Sam Waterson or Morgan Freeman, you know, you, you tend to go back again. Jamie Foxx most recently was uh-huh. the voice of uh, Jackie Robinson in our two-part series. In April. Um, But I'm not interested in celebrity. I'm interested in talent. I'm interested in maybe my audience saying, oh, that's Tom Hanks, or is that Meryl Streep, or is that Jamie Foxx? But more interested in the content. And all of those people that we mentioned have that ability, as well as folks who are less well-known that you don't know the voices, Mm -hmm. to get you not in some celebrity guessing game. Yeah. but get you into the moment that I'm trying to put you into. So no matter how recognizable, no matter how good they are, you've stopped thinking, oh, that's Tom Hanks, and you're immediately listening to what he's saying and how he's drawing you into the story in the case of the sharp, defying the Nazis, the that's, sharp score. That's very telling because not many people, like when I'm watching uh, a commercial with my husband and I say, oh, that's, uh, that's so-and-so, that, that's the actor that we all know. And he's like, what? Oh, I, I didn't realize that. So yeah. people that aren't in the business, yeah. they don't yeah. get distracted. No, no, no. You want, and, and that's the whole thing. You don't want your slip showing. You just want to say, yeah. here's the story I want to tell. So consequently, I use a lot of actors who are not sort of, quote, celebrity, bold-faced names. Right. And I often use amateurs, people, mm-hmm. writers, people in my own little small New Hampshire town, housewives, yeah. uh, town moderators. Uh, who, whenever I hear an interesting voice, mm-hmm. if I can direct them, they're in my film. There you go. Now, your new movie, Defying the Nazis, The Sharps War, is an incredible story. I mean, I was in Czech Republic a two years ago, and you could not get away from this. It was, their recognition was all over the place. Oh, I'm so happy to hear that. Yeah. This is a completely unknown story. S- Just think about it. This Unitarian minister and his wife, living a comfortable middle-class existence in Wellesley, Massachusetts, suddenly get this assignment to go into the kingdom of hell, as one of the Holocaust mm. uh, uh, scholars say in our film. And within a month from sitting by the fireside in Wellesley, they're dodging Gestapo agents and laundering money in foreign capitals and putting kids on kinder transport and secreting out documents and money and all sorts of stuff. It's just a, an amazing, intriguing story. And then they they escape just at the last moment before the Second World War begins. It actually starts where they're on the ship on the way home. And, and then they go back again the following year at great reluctance, this time to southern France. They'd hoped to set up base yeah. in, in Paris. And they're getting more people. Nobel laureates out. Uh, Martha Sharp, the wife, the heretofore you know, church wife, is now spiriting a whole group of children out, uh, taking them from their parents. And it's just an amazing, amazing story. It's about sacrifice. It's about the potential of lives that are saved and the and the la- loss of potential of lives that aren't saved. And it has huge resonance to today because we're in a refugee crisis second only to the to the Second World War. And it makes you wonder what would you do right now? Yeah, the sharp yeah. say throughout the film, oh, anybody would do this. And of course, mm-hmm. they're being modest. The yeah, yeah. Honest. Now, how do you how do you come about? I mean, I'm sure there's there's many, many, many interesting stories out there. How do you choose the ones you pursue? In this case, a very dear friend of mine who happens to be the grandson of the Sharps had been working mm. on a project about them since he was 14 and learned from a reluctant mother still smarting from the abandonment she felt because they had to leave their small kids behind in the care of the congregation and disappear. Um, he learns about it and he starts plowing towards it, various projects and, you know, a school report. And then finally a, a film as an adult. And I'd known him for years. And he sent me three years ago, a rough cut emphasis, mm-hmm. rough. And I just said, you know what, I've got working on five or six other films, but let me on the weekends at night, you know, after a long day of editing on another project, just try to make this better. And I started off, you know, as, a, as a, just an advisor. A labor of love. And, and, in yeah, a labor of love. Just trying to help a good friend. I mean, he's mm-hmm. a, Artemis is a wonderful human being. And it's fully his film. But the idea was just to make it better. And I, I got Tom Hanks to read the voice of Wait Still. I restructured it. I repaced it in a lot of ways. I ordered other archives. And I, I just feel extraordinarily blessed to be able to help Artemis realize what is literally a lifelong dream. Well, one final question. How did you become the namesake 
of an effect <laughs> on <laughs> so, Apple, so on, on de- iMovie, and on Final so Cut. So in December of 2002, Steve Jobs gave me a call and said, would you come and visit me? And I, I, was, I said, that's me knocking at your door. Oh, sure. I flew to Cupertino, California, and he led me into a room with a couple of engineers, and they'd been perfecting or trying to perfect for months this the, you know, very simple pan and zoom, a kind of superficial version of what I do with old still photographs. Right. And they had perfected it. And it, the next month, January of 2003, all Mac computers from then on, which <laughs> is what happened, would have this effect. And their working title was the Ken Burns effect. And I smiled. And Steve <laughs> says, and we want to keep the name. And I said, look, I'm sorry. I don't do commercial endorsements. Oh. And he said, what? And so we went to his office. We disappeared. We talked about it for a long time. Uh-huh. And in the end, I agreed to it. And Apple gave me a lot of hardware and software, which I, in turn, gave to nonprofits, you know, Excellent. schools That's and great. and and. Ne- and nonprofits, and I just felt that was a good way to, to do it because I don't, I don't do commercial endorsements. Mm-hmm. Part of my thing is to stick with the public broadcasting service, emphasis on service. And, and yet what it did is it created you know, a very short 10-year uh, you know, uh, friendship with Steve Jobs, which, I've, which I really valued That's and, and really enjoyed and had a chance to know him and his family before he passed away. That's a great way to, and a touching way to end the interview today. It's, I could talk to you forever, Ken. Thank you so much for taking some time to talk. Not at all. I'm Carl Bishop for Wise Brother Media.